28 and I'm trying to shape history Pulling from the sky for some strength to take with me Line up the stars, uh, fly away quickly And push the world forward like a tidal wave hit me I ride the wave swiftly, I fear no man Check my titles mate quickly Came from the sky with the light of day in me And grew my own wings so the pilot G'day guys, welcome to episode 201 of Ask Jack D. Today I am joined not by one, but by three incredible guests. Should we start with the dogs? Start with the dogs. Okay, we'll start with the dogs. Over here we have Levi. He's just stepped off the catwalk in Milan. He's got his cool jacket with us today. Over here we have Mr. Bear, of course. And over to my left, I'm very excited to be introducing Ryan from HubSpot. Ryan ran marketing across APAC for Salesforce for a number of years, and today is the director of marketing over at HubSpot has just recently flown in from being over in New Zealand, so we appreciate him being here with, with us. us. Thanks, Thanks for being here, mate. Yeah. 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 How, How have you been? been? What was going on over in NZ? NZ? Um, uh, so NZ had their annual um, big digital marketing event. They do it once a year. Um, a little under like a thousand people there. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. really interesting. They start events at 7 a.m. on the dot in Auckland, though, which... 7 a.m.? Like, like, like people you... were literally speaking at 7 a.m. That's I was like, that would never fly in Sydney. No. Um, <laughs> but like, they don't get a whole lot of content out there in NZ. So like, they're ready to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they want to go from 7 a.m. to 10 yeah, p.m. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. Guys, we've got Ryan today. He's obviously an expert when it comes to digital marketing, uh, creating communities, turning communities into customers and customer attention. Uh, so we are very much looking forward uh, to a good discussion. discussion. It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Rosie, how are you doing? I'm really good. Yeah. Excited this episode. Episode 201. How do you feel about that? We've come... This I know, we've come a long way. 201 is a lot of episodes. It's a lot of episodes. It's a huge amount of yeah. episodes. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Rosie, you got some good questions for us today? Uh, yes, we do. We have a lot of marketing questions today. Good, good, good. good. So... Fire. Okay, cool. So the first question comes from Liz Jarvis from Facebook. She says, I'm super passionate about empowering entrepreneurs to deal with their numbers and the accounting professionals that serve them up. I'm still struggling with a marketing solution to a boring and scary problem. I'm sure, they're, I'm sure my customers are out there, but I can't find them and I'd love any tips for marketing my online program. Mm. It's a really good question. It is. Do you want me to start? You can <clears throat> So, I mean, so there's a few things I think Louise mentioned. So she talks about um, in the accounting industry. So obviously, you know, it's a little bit dry of, of the industries from a marketing content, right? Travel, there's a lot of sexy things that you can do for different industries. So I think the first thing to think about in terms of how you connect with customers in that industry, and it's the same for every industry, it's really getting to the heart of what is it that your target buyer persona goes to yeah. Google and searches for. Yeah, yeah. Um, like too often people create content really close to their brand. Mm. So we talk about it at HubSpot, the idea of like the funnel. Yeah, mm. so like top, middle and bottom of the funnel. And when someone comes to your website, they're all in different buying cycles. Yeah. And if they know about your product and your service and on a pricing page, that's like bottom of funnel content. Like mm. they're interested in you, but most people mm. aren't. Mm. Um, and so it's really about like, what is it that an accountant goes to Google and searches for yeah. before they even know about your company? So you shouldn't be creating a whole lot of content about your company. It should be, it might be like, how do I, you know, survive end of June madness? Um, like that is literally what they might be searching for. And totally. Google Trends would show that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say like that'd be like the first thing on my mind, Rosie, that Louise should think about is like getting yeah. to the heart of her customer and yeah. what it is they search for. What are they searching for when they identify they have the problem that exactly. she solves? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's almost like even before they have, like they know that you have a, a, a solution to their problem. Yeah. So yeah. it's like the life cycle of a customer is it's, ac it's, um, it's awareness, awareness, consideration and decision, right? I mean, there's yeah. obviously variations of that. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, when someone, I, I, when I spoke to some customers yesterday in New Zealand, one of the customers um, runs uh, like a legal company and she was saying that no one in our business can create content about legal. So how does she hire a content marketer that's really experienced at le like in law mm. to create that kind of a content? And I was like, well, like the person isn't searching for that really bottom of the funnel content. Like yeah. that content is what the lawyer is meant to do face to face with them yeah. as a customer. That's the actual service. Yeah, that's the yeah. service itself. So you're not creating that kind of content. You're creating the things that the lawyer is looking for yeah. at the very top of the funnel. So they might be searching for, you know, someone that wants to, you know, find a lawyer might be searching for, like this is an awkward example, but someone just like brushed my leg at work. Is that like an okay <laughs> thing? I, th I thought you were doing that to <laughs> me a few moments ago. I was, but that was intentional, so it was different. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, all those things, like, you know, if my boss hasn't given me a raise and they said they will, like, is that yeah. something that is okay? Mm -hmm. So, like, they don't realize that there's a lawyer needed at that mm -hmm. point in time, and maybe there isn't. But your content should diagnose those questions that they're asking for online. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be a manager um, wanting to find content online. So, the point that I tried to make to the person I was speaking with yesterday was that it actually everyone as a marketer can create that content because it's just the things that people are searching for online. Yeah. It's not about that really technical thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to delve more into the consumer stuff, but before we do, Google Trends. Let's mm. say, what's her name? Sorry, Liz. 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 Liz has never used Google Trends before. Yeah. She goes in. How, what does she like? How does she start looking for the keywords? What advice would you give her to navigate? Google nice. Trends to get the best outcome? Yeah, really good question. So I think, I mean, firstly, she's, she, she knows her industry as an accountant. So she would have a rough idea what people are searching yeah, for. Yeah. So Google Trends isn't really good for finding new trends. It's good for comparing trends. Yeah. So I'll put it in, not in an accounting example, because I don't know accounting at all. But, um, you know, if I think about marketers and business growth, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when we're creating content, you know, and our target persona is marketers and people wanting to grow their business with a marketing platform. Mm -hmm. So when we're creating our next blog post or our next ebook, we could create one about, let's just say, event marketing, or we could create one about blogging. So they're the topics that I put into Google Trends, yeah. event marketing, blogging, and then Google's going to show me, like, what are people searching for? And it'll compare yeah. the trend lines. Yeah. And I would predict, and I've already done this research, that event marketing is going down because people know that they're not able to connect in a broad scale of people for events in the same way as they can for content online. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how Google Trends comes in, yes. to actually just work yeah. out which piece of content is better. Yeah. A tool like BuzzSumo, though, which is fully free, um, in, like a, in a freemium perspective, that then you can put in a competitor, you can put in your website, and it'll then recommend content topics that you could create content about. So that's kind of content discovery. Google Trends is like content analysis and comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah beautiful. Sense. So between the two, you've got a beautiful marriage to go, what are people looking for, to what degree, and is it trending up or down, therefore should I invest in time and content and money in going down that pathway? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I totally agree with everything that Ryan has said. Um, first, I, I kind of disagree with the boring, I agree with the scary, but the scary yeah. is sexy from a marketing perspective. We want our consumer problem to scare them. Because it helps us market. market. Well, I mean, yeah, you definitely want it to drive them to an action, right? Yeah. Um, but fear is a good motivator to drive to action. Yes and no. I don't know if I want to be like getting my people to be fearful or no. my prospective customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, we, we actually go with the same route. So we don't play to fear necessarily, nor do we try, you know, that 80 sales methodology where it's sort of mm. like focus on avoiding pain rather than yeah. avoiding pleasure because it's more powerful motivator. We don't do that either. But if the problem is inherently worrying oh, the totally. individual, then that means they're going to want to do something bad. Like if I've got a little bit of a sore tooth, cool, I'll put it up with it. But if tomorrow it gets a little bit sore, the day after that it's really Absolutely. sore, when the pain yeah. gets bigger, that's when I'm going to do Absolutely. something bad. And the thing is, like, what is it that you do? Like, you go to Google. <coughs> do you know what I mean? Like, time. Unless you've already got someone that fills that service, you might have yeah. a dentist that you've been using since you were a child. Yeah. So you yeah. might then skip Google and go to your phone book and call them yeah. and book in an appointment. Yeah. For most services around the world, though, like, and for most products and services, people yeah. don't have a set service or product that they will use. Yeah. Yeah. And um, like, I think our status recently is that 30% of all searches done every day on Google are brand new. Mm. So like every day, 30% of the p things that people are searching for haven't been searched for before. Mm. So there's just so many opportunities to create content around those yeah, things. Yeah. So this is where I was going with that is understand the emotions of your consumer, right? I don't see, Lizzie, I don't see your product as boring. I do see the consequences of not using your product as scary. That's a good thing, but that's anti-boring, right? That means it's engaging. And so from a marketing perspective, we spent, like, for instance, my game is education, right? It has been for, for, for the sort of foreseeable past. And what that means is that we obsess about what goes on in the hearts and minds of our consumer in that space to, to a point where, and you kind of Im, sort of implied this earlier, that you're not even really talking about your product in the first instance. You're talking about something that addresses the problems of your consumer. So the four things that I'd be thinking about, Lizzie, in terms of hearts and minds of a consumer, what frustrates them around the problem that they have and searching for a potential solution. What are their ultimate fears? If it is scary, what ultimately are they fearing? And then go to Google and see if they're actually typing it in to see if it's an active concern that they're searching for on digital. Um, what do they want? 
in terms of the immediate alleviation or the immediate solution to this problem? What do they want? And then what do they ultimately dream of? Do they have a vision in terms of, you know, I want to have my small business, I want the financial management to be taken care of so that I can spend more time being happy and doing the things I love, whatever that might be. But you're going fears, uh, sorry, frustrations, fears, wants and dreams. Between those four quadrants, you can map out what's going on inside of your consumer. That will give you an indication of what they're searching for, but then speak to that. Your product will come later. And so I wouldn't, I don't view your segment as boring. I view it as really important. And more importantly, so do your consumers. Definitely. Cool. Rosie, next question. Okay, cool. So this question comes from yeah, Alex Barnett from <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he says, Ryan and Jack, content obviously forms a big part of both of your marketing strategies. Two questions for you. First one, how do you consistently come up with new ideas that haven't been done before? And secondly, as an, Jack, as an entrepreneur, how do you even find the time to create so much content? I'm running my business by myself at the moment and have no time. Very good question. Uh, what was the first one? So how do you consistently come up with new ideas that yeah. haven't been done before? Okay. You talk about the ideas, I'll talk about the time. Sure. Um, so look, I think on the ideas front, so it ties into the buyer persona firstly, like knowing really what it is that they are searching for and want online. Um, the, the thing that we recommend everyone does when they're going into this space is fill out a content audit worksheet. So it looks at basically, so you have different personas of your business. So, um, you know, for the accounting business before, they might have someone that's like a, a junior accountant and a senior accountant. The things that they search for online are really different. A senior accountant's looking for how, do they, how they can increase their, um, you know, their spend, how they can cut budgets and whatnot. The person that's actually more junior than them is actually the doer. Mm. So in our world for marketing, our personas at HubSpot, we have a marketing Mary. She's like a, a middle range marketing manager who's like, you know, super smart, ambitious, but is doing stuff. And then we have a I corporate Kathy persona. <laughs> corporate yeah, corporate Kathy. <laughs> we love alliteration at HubSpot. We have owner Ollie as well. I could talk to you about owner Ollie. Um, you're actually an owner Ollie. I'm owner but Ollie. corporate Kathy you're is... <laughs> So corporate Kathy would be um, potentially Rosie's boss, for example, who's like the one like cracking the whip on Rosie, okay? And so, yes. so yeah, yeah. So and that person wouldn't necessarily be actually doing the marketing themselves. Mm. So they're not searching for things to make their job easier. They're wanting, they're working out like how to measure the ROI of the stuff that a marketing mm. manager is doing. Mm. So they're searching for different things. So you need to firstly work out the personas, and then you need to build them out across your sales cycle. So you know the awareness, consideration, decision. And what I'll always find when I speak to people about this is they've got a lot of content in the, dis in the consideration decision phase about their business yeah. and they don't have enough like further up the funnel in awareness yeah. Yeah. for what that person's looking for before they ever come in touch with their yeah. brand. Yeah. So just doing that, I mean, that's not helping them necessarily with ideas, but it's just showing where there are holes in their content strategy. No, I think that does help with ideas because if you've got awareness, consideration, what was the third one? Decision. decision. Yeah. And then, so you've got three layers mm. and three consumer segments. You've now got a matrix of nine different components to think into again. to go, well, what would work for that segment? What would work for that segment? So from a, from a model to think into, I think that actually does help people come up with ideas. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in terms of working out where there are opportunities to create content, I think then in terms of then once you see those holes, then the actual, okay, what does that awareness content look like for Mary? That's where I think then you do some research online, use BuzzSumo, use Google Trends yeah. and get an idea. I mean, even just ask your database as well. Yeah. I mean, if you're an existing business, you, you would do that. If yeah. not, um, you know, you'd speak to the people within your business. They should yeah. know about these personas in depth. Yeah. And if they don't, that's like a red flag. Like mm -hmm. people always come up to me and say, um, you know, we're having issues with content, like we can't create content. And I'm like really matter of fact with them, I'm like if you can't create content or work out what to create, mm. you probably don't know your buyer persona well enough and Absolutely. there's someone else in a better business for product or service that is. Right. And so like content is really beautiful at democratizing business in my opinion, because anyone can compete with budget for ads. Mm. You know, if you think about, you know, just a company like Salesforce versus a smaller company that might be starting up in that same space, yeah. Salesforce are gonna spend a ton of money on ads. Yeah. Um, you know, so the only way really like people can compete with folks that have really big budgets is to start to think about the content that people are organically searching for. 100%. Um, because the big sort of mammoths in the industry won't be thinking that same way. They're yeah. just thinking about yeah. selling product and using ads to do That's that. Right. And, and their connection with consumer, and I mean that both from a sort of psychology perspective, they're, they're somewhat further removed oh, from the consumer. 
and their connection in terms of their actual relationship with consumer is also quite distant and removed, right? Entirely. And, and so you, it's a massive If you market. look at this sale, like the sales cycle that bigger companies look at and just the way in which they optimise spend around ads, it's mm. all about just literally getting a conversion. A lot of the time you won't see them looking at the churn of customers yeah. after, after they become a customer. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about inbound marketing and content marketing is that it's definitely not a quick win solution, like creating mm. content. Mm. Um, so people, a lot of the time, won't convert into HubSpot customers after until like two years or so. Mm. They've been consuming our content on our blog and it's only two yeah. years later that they realize yeah. that the HubSpot like sales and marketing platform might work for them. And so that's perfect for us because it means that they're not going to churn as likely because they've right. come to the realization that they yeah. need our product or service, not by us pushing there. it down them. Yeah, and they yeah. trust us. Yeah. So we have a sales cycle that's a couple of weeks, yeah. whereas a yeah. normal software vendor has months, if not years, yeah. because they haven't built that connection. The relationship yet. So I think that's important. And yeah. I think the other half of the question was around, so what we talked about the ideas and then it was the time. time. Yeah. So with regards to time, firstly, um, <laughs> <laughs> We've been speaking about this a lot lately. Mm. In that, uh, so I spend about a third of my time, well, I'd like to spend a third of my time on PR, branding, reaching out into the world type of activities, of which content for me and us fits into that category in terms of my schedule, a third of the time. And so, so when I say PR, it's either filming stuff or it's speaking at places or it's doing media interviews and newspaper interviews. I'm getting dog hair on my face as I talk. Um, all that sort of stuff, right? Now, we have probably gotten to the point where I need to spend less time doing live things like this, right? Currently, if I want to spend a third, I'm probably right now spending maybe 10 or 15% more than that, right? So we're trying to trim that back to a degree. But the other component to this is, uh, well, for, first let me just, qualify that by saying I've got a team of 90 people out there right and so how I build my calendar is very purposeful and very deliberate and I'm able to delegate anything and everything that I don't want to do or that I'm not the best person to do so early on you know my first few years of business it wouldn't have been a third of my time on PR it might have been 10 or 15 percent so it will sort of expand and contract relative to your current role and your skill sets um, however for us it's a lot about you know, what we're now getting better at is multi-purposing content, right? So this is the kind of stuff that I choose to do because I love to do it. Uh, however, we could discuss 16 things in this episode that Rosie can go away, get it transcribed, turn it into a blog post, run yeah. it by me, publish it. Cut it into little short Instagram videos. That's, yes, That's exactly, which, yeah. is, which is exactly what, what she's doing right now. So, and again, you know, we, we've got a, a small marketing team. So what, it, what that enables me to do by way of time as the entrepreneur is do the things that I need to do and then we go how else can this content and the bite-sized pieces of this content travel so that one content piece mm. might become literally 20 or 30 um, yeah. because of because you know the great people around me absolutely and I think you don't need to necessarily go into I mean you know a podcast or a vcast like this is great but I mean, you could even do a, you know, a, a much simpler thing to even think of in the early stages is just if you are writing a blog, you know, dependent on all the different topics that you're creating blog content about, like bucket them into like what, certain topics and then that is an ebook. you know, like you take that That's content right. out, you put it into like a, a long form content piece, like mm -hmm. an ebook, and now mm -hmm. you've got like a downloadable piece of content mm -hmm. that moves mm -hmm. from just being top of funnel content to being lead gen. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So little things like that are just easy 100%. as, you know? And yeah. then each of those blog posts can be used as emails within a nurture and drip series. Yeah. So you're just, yeah, thinking about a smart way to leverage your content. And That's right. the, the thing about content and that I try and like get into entrepreneurs' heads is that when you start a blog for your business, once you create that piece of content, that first blog post and everyone after that, like you own that content, it sits on your site, it's getting organic traffic for you. Mm. So there's an example that I was talking about yesterday in New Zealand and it's, and it's we have a, a press, a, a blog post about press releases. Um, and if you search for press release, press release template, the HubSpot blog post is the number one that you'll find globally. Mm. And that search term press release gets, oh hey, gets around 12,000 monthly searches just for press releases. Wow. Okay, so we've generated I think about 300,000 visits wow. from this one blog post. And it just keeps going up and up and up because press releases are getting more and more important. And so like that content that we created two years ago so is cool. still driving compound visits and leads and customers for yeah, us. Yeah. We've obviously added hundreds, if not no, thousands, if not tens of thousands of blog posts since then. And they're all adding to that. 
So like, as an entrepreneur, the thing that I try and explain is that you own all that content. It's almost like, it's almost like a, something on your balance sheet as an entrepreneur when you're, if you're yeah. wanting to sell or get valuated. Um, you know, if you can say that I'm getting organic traffic to my site mm. um, and it's not going down because it's all off of old content, it's not coming from paid, mm. that changes like your CAC, yeah. your customer acquisition costs, it changes your ROI, your lifetime yeah. value of customers. Yeah. It really re like changes the positioning. And yeah. so as a, as a CFO and trying to explain to them how to invest in content versus advertising and renting an audience is, is quite a different yeah. story. And it's, it's a beautiful point. I think we... Sorry guys, Bear's getting... <laughs> all right. It's all right. It's cool. Please sit down. <laughs> okay. He is the star of the show. He, he can pretty much do whatever he likes. He's completely blocking now. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, Rosie. Next question. Let's move on. Okay. The next question. Um, <laughs> okay. So sometimes I feel like I'm wasting my time on social media and producing content, not really getting any ROI. What am I doing wrong? What are the essentials for getting the most out of your content? It's from Mike Taylor from Facebook. Mm, mm. So I think we've probably discussed this a little bit already, but in my view, you need to view social and as the front end of the funnel, right? Any platform that you use, like a consumer facing platform, be it Facebook, be it Insta, be it Snapchat, be it like live event, it doesn't matter. The effectiveness of that mode or the effectiveness of that channel in terms of converting customers for you and your business is the effectiveness of how good is your funnel after that or post that, right? Which is this whole awareness. <laughs> awareness. awareness. What's the second uh, one? Consideration, <laughs> consideration, consideration decision. decision. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so if you want to move them through those different stages, like we've got, you know, and I suppose what, what's interesting to think from an entrepreneurial standpoint is that most of what is broadcast and amplified is that front facing thing. But don't be fooled as a consumer or as an early stage entrepreneur that that's all a HubSpot or an entourage is doing. Because we'll do all of this stuff that's front facing, but behind each thing, like even behind this video, there'll be actions and marketing actions across probably several different social media channels that will follow, that will help us move consumers through the customer journey, right? And so it's about not thinking that a Facebook like or a comment on a video, albeit is great, and I think it, like, I genuinely think it is great for, to build relationship. Um, that's not what equates to customers. What equates to customers is whatever funnel we have coming after that. That's definitely it. And I, I think um, like the key piece of it all is when you said that it's not Entourage, it's not HubSpot. I think the thing is that people don't realise what they should be posting on social. It's because and it, it really just always comes back to personas. And I don't want to. I, like I feel like I need to say that over and over when I speak to people. The reason being is that they're posting content about their business yeah, to social. Yeah, yeah. Like, this isn't about the entourage. Yeah, this is the exact about, point. Yeah, like, we're talking yeah. about marketing. We're talking about business growth. We're talking about yeah. things that our audience, yours and mine, cares about. We're not talking about how great the entourage is and how great HubSpot That's is. Right. They're both great. Yeah. But people don't care about the entourage yeah. or HubSpot. That's right. yeah. So people like, haven't gotten that out of their minds yet that no one cares about your business That's on right. social. They yeah. care about what they're looking for. Same with media, same with traditional yeah, media, absolutely. same with everything. Like no we one... never go to market talking about us. You go to market talking about consumer. Totally. It's kind of like the humble brag idea. You know on social media when someone posts a photo of themselves um, and it, like a, there's like some really good BuzzFeed lists and it'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to go to work again and they're in like an Uber X, or sorry, an Uber exec car and it's like they do it every day. Um, and so like that's showing off the car. Right, like that's like them like subliminally like marketing to their audience. But if they posted a post saying like, how awesome am I in my Uber exec? Like no one's gonna like that because everyone's mm. gonna think they're a douchebag. Mm. Mm. So it's kind of like, <laughs> I'm not saying that like content and inbound is about the humble brag, because it's not, right? We haven't really spoken about Entourage or HubSpot yeah. at all here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's it's that point. same kind of concept. Yeah, you aren't talking about yourself. You're yes. talking about things that they're interested in. So yeah. the moment you're creating content on Snapchat or on Instagram about just things that the persona is interested in, that's what will engage them. Yeah. And I think it's about the... It's, that, that is not enough. I, I, I know a lot of people that have Instagram accounts or Facebook and they've got millions, if not hundreds of them, and they're, they're doing the good content stuff right. Mm. But there's zero back end. Back end so in terms of like where they're driving people to or? Yeah. In terms of product to market fit, in terms of product mm. to consumer segment fit. 
like the, the challenge that they're having in terms of ROI with mm. social isn't necessarily linked to a lack of fans or a lack of mm. social engagement. Yeah. It's about recognizing that that's the front end challenge. Yeah. And, and what are you about, doing from that? Yeah. yeah. There's about eight or 10 steps behind that that are totally. equally, if not more important, mm. if you want to monetize. Definitely. Right? When it kind of, d d like, it, it's all about really, yeah, where you're driving people. So when you mentioned the funnel, it's like, okay, so what is your social strategy? If your social strategy is about getting people to your website, do you know what I mean? Then you're going to have CTAs in your content about driving them to the blog post that you're sharing to then get them there. But yeah. that might not be the case. It might be getting them to your Snapchat page because yeah. you might have 2 million Facebook fans, but zero on Snapchat. And so you're directing people by sharing your Snapchat logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes down to, yeah, working out where is it that you want to get people. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, people will interact with you in lots of different ways, right? Like I'm sure a lot of your Snapchat followers may not follow you on Instagram. Like there's mm. different demographics. Mm. So mm. if you have time and you obviously are doing lots of different channels, mm. like that's giving you the maximum exposure, mm. right? To mm. all of your different personas mm. that would be interested mm. in you. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, I, I reckon I could bet money on this actually, mm. that like the, the audience that follows you on Snapchat right now isn't the audience that's gonna buy from the entourage right now, but give yeah. them like a year or yeah. two, like that, that audience is like getting inspired by your content. Yeah. And a year or two when they have an idea, then they come to the 100%. entourage for it. 100%. So it's like a long-term game social and it's yes. about community and engagement. Yes, and, that, and that's a really important point around ROI, right? We view everything in terms of dynamics, or well, I view everything to dynamics and mechanics, right? So in marketing, if you look at dynamics, which is the relationship, the content, the kind of hard to run something, then you've got mechanics, your CTAs, your acquisition, your, your, your conversion metrics, all of that sort of stuff. We do all of this dynamic stuff. First of all, from a personal point of view, I do a lot of my content because I, you know, part of why I think I'm here is to sort of um, s spread this message in a yeah, sense, right? And so I'm really yeah. passionate about it. But from a, if we're talking about someone that's just started a toothpaste business and she or she looking to do social because they want to, for commercial reasons, the dynamic stuff should be there to increase conversions on your mechanical stuff, right? Definitely. And so why do you do content? So that when you post an ad to Facebook, rather than it converting at 0.9%, it converts at 1.4%, which is a 50% increase mm. in conversion because you've done the work to build relationship. But you're absolutely right. In terms of our Snapchat audience, they are far... Uh, earlier for us in terms of propensity and readiness to buy. Yeah, and so and at the end of the day, it's really about working out what is the metric that you want to, to drive um, and focusing on just one thing with each kind of tactic that you're doing. So an example for us is when we launched a new blog at HubSpot and we just launched about a year ago our Japan blog. We're opening up our office like in a few months time. So a year before we do that, we launch our blog, which helps us generate organic traffic, then leads. And so then in a year's time, our sales team has a big heavy funnel to then work. Um, the, the first thing that we focus on when we launch that blog is just subscribers. So we're posting all of the Japanese blog content to mm. our Facebook mm. Japanese audience. Mm. The goal there is always about moving them through that Facebook social post mm. to the blog to then subscribe. Yeah. Um, and then we know if we build up the subscribers over a period of time, they will yeah. then move into leads and then into customers. Yeah. But we know that that's the, the end goal with those people. So yeah. I think just being smart about that and the content that we're sharing on Facebook and on Snapchat is never about our platform yeah. because we're trying to build up a really big audience and then that audience will then work out that we have the yeah. right product for yeah. them if they need yeah. to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's what we think about it. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to know what that customer journey is. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Like all, all roads need to lead to Rome and you need to know what Rome is and you need to know what are going to be the most effective paths delineated mm. by consumer segment in order to get them to Rome happily. Exactly. And, then, and then the mechanics piece of what you talked about, I think, is important as well. So once, you've, you know, once you are doing the right kinds of content, you're sharing the right kinds of content, you then want to be obviously pushing it out there. But then, you know, if I'm, you know, I, I'm not a customer of the Entourage, right? So if I click through one of your blog posts, the website that I should be seeing, the entourage.com or whatever, mm. should be different to what mm. a customer of yours sees. Mm. Mm. So, the, you know, we're both interested in the same content, but then yeah. your CMS platform yeah. should have different, like, calls to actions for me yeah. because it sees that I'm a lifecycle stage unknown versus yeah. lifecycle stage customer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, that's really what important. What I'm saying is the majority of really estate businesses don't even think beyond step oh, one, absolutely. let alone different categories, different stages, different segments, mm. right? And so I think in terms of practical takeaway for you guys is know what your customer, if you're doing stuff on Facebook, where is step two yeah, in this particular that? funnel? Where's step three, where's step four? When do they get to Rome? 
in this piece of content? What's the journey behind totally. each piece of content? Rosie, I don't think we need you for this episode. I think Ryan and I could just talk all day. I know. We're at, we the, might, 30, we we're at the 30 minute mark. Are we really? We are, we're at 30 really minutes. <laughs> there was two questions, maybe. Was that two questions? No, it's we need four questions. We need four questions. Oh, did we? I thought we did yeah. two as well. We can keep going. We might have to cut here for Facebook and keep going for the podcast. Let's do one more question oh, one more and we'll question. be on our best behaviour. Okay, okay, cool. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Like when, if, when we yeah. posted it. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no. It's like a house. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, that was three questions you've done. So fourth question. How long should you run a coming soon campaign to create buzz before releasing your product sub, product or service? This one's from Ariana from Twitter. I thought you maybe recently done this. Before, yeah, so maybe yeah. About that. We do we do it a lot. Of, we do it with a lot of different. Provided we have time, any product or service that we're releasing, we always do a lead up. And there's probably there's probably several different phases of lead up. Um, The first one would be starting to mention it sporadically. And we probably do that four or five months out from release date. We then, and then phase two is to do that slightly more heavily and more frequently and more prominently across channels. And then generally speaking, and let me just preface this by saying it will completely be industry dependent because it will be consumer dependent. However, with if I was to generalise, I would suggest four to six week launch period is good. Now there's businesses that do three month launch periods. There's businesses that do, like um, with Tesla, they just sort of pre-sold cars that they won't be delivering for a couple of years. And the, pre, and the pre-launch up until that point was probably six months, right? So again, it's industry and consumer sort of specific. But um, generally speaking, I'd say between a month and two, a month or two. And the reason is this, in, our game, for instance, if somebody hears about something three months out, even if they go into a funnel, even if we get an email address, we're still able to communicate with them, by the time that the actual launch comes around, even if we do have sequences in between, then they're not as fresh or as ripe or as excited as what they would have been had it have been two or three or four weeks earlier, right? So we kind of go talk about it, try and sort of put out the whispers, stage two, talk about it a little bit more heavily. Stage three would be launch a pre-launch sequence four to six weeks in advance. Yeah, I think, so I try and actually get my team not to think in in a campaign-centric way, to be honest, because I think um, with the moment you think of anything as like a coming soon or coming now, um, I just feel like you're setting yourself up to fail in lots of ways, not saying what you're saying is Mm. that case, Mm. but um, and you know, I think if you're launching a book, you know, or there's a new TV show coming out, there's definitely a lot of pre-planning that, that's involved. And I think depending on how much time you have, like the bigger really the better, if it's a really exciting, awesome product. And yeah, you've got to think about that. But I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is making sure actually not so much like what happens pre-launch, it's like post-launch. Like what are you doing to make sure that it's still going? Yeah. And that's what like that's that's why it really doesn't matter so much about the product or service you're about to sell. It's about yeah. really your audience and building the content for them. Yeah. That's gonna keep them coming back to your site. Yeah. And if that's what the funnel looks like for you, it's like site, get them keep coming back, like they're eventually gonna learn about the book or the movie yeah. or the new toothpaste that you make. Yeah. Like through yeah. that. So I yeah. focus really much more on that piece. And then, you know, once someone shows an interest on your site, e.g. they click to like look, learn more about your book, if you know who they are, that should then fire off automations mm, that then mm. puts them in a nurturing workflow, e.g. someone that looks interested in the book. Mm, mm. So then we're starting yeah, to send yeah. them comms so that they learn more. In um, our world, pre-launches have always mm. boosted conversions and, well, boosted attention, conversions and sales upon launch. Yeah. However, you know, as I said, it might be industry specific. However, what you said, at the beginning there was really important in that if we have a six week six weeks pre-launch sequence we have a two month post-launch sequence our post-launch yeah. sequence goes for longer and more of the spend actually goes into the post-launch because you don't want to you don't want attention or conversions or even conversation to do this and then you launch and it does exactly. that right and so you want it to continue to sort of scale up exactly. post-launch yeah and that's i think that's the really really important thing because you're obviously wanting to create really just good content that's attracting people to your site. Yeah. And like your book, like it's not going anywhere, you know? Yeah. So yeah. like focusing however, on- However, there, there, is, there is certainly a moment in time where it is more topical, more exciting definitely, than it will definitely. be six or nine. And so that's what, in, in order to capitalize on the energy of a, pro, 
in the energy of a project in the early stages. Super important. Super yeah, that's really important. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I guess like around launch, like if you're doing, especially if you're doing media interviews and you're doing yeah. TV and all those things, yeah. Yeah. I kind of don't view that. That's just like kind of just the things that you're doing along it, right? But like the book itself and then the ongoing thing is yeah. really like the meaty yeah. thing. But that's right. that will help you boost a heap of awareness. Yeah, and, and, and that's even, again, Rosie's wrapping this up. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that is more, what's more difficult than a successful launch is sustaining successful sales and longevity. Mm. And so you'll get a spike of energy and, and motivation. And I, I think you can generate around probably most products, if not all products, but, uh, and, and then you've got that sort of the next two or three months. But, but how do you ensure for a book, for instance, because mm. books usually, there's obviously key exceptions, but mm. usually books come and go, right? So how do you stay relevant six months, 12 months? And that is ongoing campaigns, yeah. discussions, new things to talk about. Rosie is wrapping Absolutely. us up, Mr. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Ben, you thank are you. hopeless. Levi, you were really well behaved. Uh, guys, that was a long discussion. Was Ryan yeah. and I might need to do this again <laughs> next time. <laughs> next time. Give me a minute. Next time we um, we might actually have a couple of beers, I think. Maybe um, nice, yeah. I mean, they can have some like alcohol for it. How long do you think we could do this for? If if, if we didn't really have a time time, yeah. time limit, we could probably. We should do a live session. Three like just hour live, hour live three session. hour marketing live chat. Live Ask Jack D featuring Ryan. Mm -hmm. We do something interesting, yeah, I think, with entrepreneurs in growth for their business. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. marketing, I think, needs to move from being. Uh, on a, perhaps on a Saturday yeah. afternoon, <laughs> 1 p.m. kickoff. Wine kick and off. marketing. And, and, and there's no marketing. set finish time. It's going <laughs> to yeah. start at 1 yeah. o'clock yeah. on a Saturday afternoon. We'll, we'll oh, progressively get more drunk throughout the episode, <laughs> throughout the afternoon, and, and it'll be live. We will really. be yeah. much yeah. better advice. <laughs> Ryan Bonici, thank you very lovely, much for joining us. You um, now, you guys have a really cool tool that people can head over to HubSpot to um, check out, right? I mean, so the one thing that I was thinking about is that, so HubSpot, we have a 100% free CRM product. It's like 100% free unlimited contacts, unlimited data. So for small businesses that are starting to get into kind of the idea of like wanting to grow, but they're not fully sure, if you just go hubspot.com forward slash CRM, you can literally start using that product forever for free. Yeah. And so it's just like a nice way before, say, you're ever wanting to invest in a software or CRM tool that you're not sure of how your business might go, yeah. the HubSpot CRM is a nice way to do that. And then yeah. over time, you can then add on paid marketing products. Yeah. So that's a good one. Yeah, I'd recommend that to everyone. Beautiful. Yeah. Love it. Cool. Episode 201, thank you guys for joining us. I hope Thanks, you guys. enjoyed my three special guests for this episode. <laughs> Look forward to speaking with you next time. See you. So what that means